welcome to COVID and climate change correlations, a weekly video podcast where I, Daniel Sanderson, engage in a stimulating conversation with post Keynesian economist Steve Keen. Okay, so, um, all right, well, welcome to the next episode of COVID and Climate Change. We're here with Steve Keen. Um, and he's a post Keynesian economist. And uh, as I've said again and again, and will continue to say, Steve is a decent human being, just to <laughs> let everybody know. <laughs> So, Steve, it's like the, the 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 beginning into this sort of conversation is to just let everybody know that there's no hoodwinked sort of smoke and mirror show with the with, with the mathematics. And notice how I start with that mm. that are behind mm. and defend where you are with your economic improvements. So, yeah, that was, um, I actually had a, an interesting experience of somebody a, a QAnon type that I finally blocked after having a few amusing. Uh, Twitter exchanges with who's saying I'm I must be funded by the CIA or something like that, uh, and I'm and I'm selling this COVID hoax, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it was said, "Are you a Freemason?" And I wrote back, "No, I charge by the hour." And the guy was too <laughs> thick to realise I was making I was making a joke. He thought I'd admitted to be a member of the Freemasons. Oh my God! So yeah, forget about that. If you you know, if, if my work it proceeds from logic, and the mathematics is wrong. I'm going to say it's wrong, and it's uh, uh, it'll be a provable position. I love it. I love it. I want to spend some more time on the Royal Society because this is a big deal. I hinted to yeah, it at it the is. first. You know what? I'll probably keep bringing it up. The issue mm. about some of the destinations of these videos, YouTube and otherwise, is the fact that sometimes people come in and they descend into episode number 432, mm. right? So although something seems intuitive for me and you, you're going to say, Dan, you keep bringing up the Royal Society. You keep bringing up my paper. Why is it that you keep doing this? Mm. We talked about it last week. Look, we got to bring it up again. We have to mm. talk about it. This is a big deal, Steve. So tell me what you're doing. You're, I think it's a, a one-year timeline to be able to release this paper to the version of the Royal Society. Is that right? It, it, it depends on uh, basically public, publishing deadlines. But uh, the, I was. I wrote a paper for a journal called Globalizations, uh, which was the title was the appallingly bad neoclassical economics of climate change, and what I did in that was I write for a, a general non-technical audience uh, what, why Nordhaus's uh, ideas about climate were so incredibly obviously wrong, uh, and that was labor related to the fact that he basically made up numbers that made climate change look like it was trivial, but the way he made up the numbers was a joke. Uh, it should have been a joke. It should have been obvious to him that it was a joke. Uh, now, that was, uh, as I said, written for a non-technical audience, and as it happens, one of the review editors for Proceedings of the Royal Society uh, saw the article and said he wanted to have a, a more t technical one written for the science community, and that is delightful to me because I want scientists to take on economics. I think uh, there's a there's a, a tendency in academic disciplines in general not to intrude on somebody else's turf, except for economics. And economics has this uh, uh, tendency, which which comes out of the, um, uh, the the vision it has of its it, it's it's this deep truth that economists think they've found with neoclassical economics that they think they should take over every area in social sciences. So there's a classic paper from a guy called Ed Lazare who was for a while Bush's chief economic advisor between 2004 and 2008, uh, and the title of the article is Economic Imperialism. And he actually said that economics is the only social science, the only science in, in the social studies, and should take over all other areas of social science. It was quite an arrogant paper. Well, Ed Lazaro then met him shortly after the financial crisis occurred on his watch, and he basically of saying, look, you know, I don't know much of this stuff. I'm a labour economist. Uh, but the, 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 and he's a very nice bloke, I might, he's died recently. But uh, the arrogance that economists have to believe they can put their noses into anybody else's trough. Well, that's exactly what Nordhaus has done over climate change. He shouldn't have put his nose in in the first place because he clearly doesn't understand what it is. But because he's an economist and because politicians respond to what economists have to say, in many ways what Nordhaus first of all, said and then set up as the way 
mainstream economists to praise climate change means that a, a politicians have regarded climate change as a second or third order important issue because mm -hmm. his, his arguments were as trivial compared to other, other factors that are going to affect the economy. Now, um, with the, the, it's manifestly false, obviously false arguments, but it got through economics and it got, they gave him the Nobel Prize. Uh, now, what I want to do is alert scientists to how shoddy the work is and say, do not let your usual respect for somebody else's intellectual uh, uh, area stop you from attacking economists because they've done it to you. You're not aware of this, but they've undermined everything you've done to point about the seriousness of climate change, every last thing you've had to say. So that's the paper I'm working on. And as it happens, fortunately, uh, I'm getting with a team of six people um, one of whom is a, a atmospheric physicist I've worked with before in terms of the role of energy in production, but another is the one of the uh, is a climate scientist who Nordhaus completely misrepresented his research, and so we're opening the paper with uh, just a, a, a you know outright undeniable proof that Nordhaus read black and saw white, mm. uh, red, red danger and saw safety. Uh, and it is just his, his summary of that paper was so bad that, as I said, if I had a student who submitted what Nordhaus wrote as a summary of, of Lenton's paper, I would fail that student. I wouldn't yeah. give the student the Nobel bloody prize. I'd fail the student. So this is now a chance to say to scientists, everything that you would normally be deferential of what economists do, stop being deferential, go on the attack against them because they are undermining your efforts to raise awareness of the dangers of climate change. Okay. Steve, I got a couple points that I want to talk about. Um, the first off is a, um, a reference back to any of the listeners that either pulled this article or this interview from the Planksip site, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, what I will do is I'm going to try and find some of these supplemental materials and post them so that they're easily accessible for people engaging in this video. Okay. okay. Hopefully, I'll put that in the, uh, the, the link of the description. It may not be immediate, but we'll improve mm -hmm. and try and put and access that so that it's easily accessible for the viewers. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, the next question that I have for you, and this is a little bit of um, a collaborative question on the creation of a meme. Here's some ideas that I'm thinking of. So, mm -hmm. um, and that may not be your 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 wheelhouse, um, but I think the 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 conversation about the idea is important. So I'm thinking mm -hmm. of a meme that communicates the message that something controversial, and from a contrarian, this may be too contrarian, but. It's like the message is don't trust economists except Steve Keen or something to that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, he, exactly. Here's the thing. Is it too far? Are we, is that the message? Do we want to have it launch into something that says, you know, the video is a little bit more, it, it's that clicker attention grabber. And then it comes on to say what we mean by that is da, 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 da right? Mm. Or should the entry point be something it, it is about messaging. It really is. It's about messaging mm -hmm. and what we want to convey. Yeah. Well, I mean, a, a large part of this is that, you know, you know, we trust people who are called experts in different fields. And we have to because we live in an incredibly complex society where if you try to know everything uh, that you are using, you'd never, get, you'd never get out of bed. I mean, for example, when you hop in a car and, and, and turn the ignition switch, you have no idea, most of us have no idea what goes on to make the vehicle turn and wheels start turning. And if you insisted that you had to know that and be able to build it yourself, you wouldn't have a car in the first place. And you, you, might, you might have a horse and buggy, uh, but you certainly wouldn't have a, a car. So we have to trust expertise and it's natural for us to do that and it makes life a lot easier that you can do that. Now, that means that we trust an engineer um, because they call themselves an engineer, but also because what they build, we drive over every day, we drive in every day, and it doesn't, the bridges don't fall over and the cars don't break down all that often. Um, so we have you know, feedback that tells us we should trust them as well. With the economy, you've got a whole different ballgame because the economy exists whether or not economists do. There could be not a single person on the planet who called themselves an economist, we'd still have an economy. 
Okay? So economists can take credit for what actually happens because of the economy itself. Okay? It's, it's not something anybody has built. Uh, and yet at the same time, what we'll do is we'll build mental models of the economy and those mental models will guide our interpretations of the real economy, but they may be completely at odds with how the real economy actually operates. Now, you would hope that the standard practice of science would filter out those ideas and over a couple of centuries at least, you'd end up with a realistic picture of the economy and how it operates. But that hasn't happened. Uh, we have still caught in the middle of what are bad, uh, well-disguised ideological wars. Uh, which began in the 19th century but between Marx, who made the previous classical school a critique of capitalism rather than the defence of it, and the neoclassicals who were trying to build an alternative way of looking at the economy, which in its own guise was reasonable back in the 19th century, but fundamentally they were pro-capitalist. Uh, and, and then what you've had is this um, building of an ideology after that uh, it, it was quite possible that the neoclassical economists could have um, happened upon the right way to look at the economy in the same way that Copernicus happened upon the right way to look at the solar system, which is that the sun is the centre, not the earth. Okay? Uh, but no, that's not what they did. They've, they've got a model which is, as, as I said, as, as elaborate and as flawed as Ptolemy's vision of the earth-centric universe, and they defend that against all comers. Uh, and you don't have uh, the usual progression that occurs in a science where some anomaly comes along for a false paradigm, a paradigm which has a fundamental flaw. Some anomaly comes along and the paradigm can't progress uh, or the science, this discipline can't progress until it resolves that anomaly and that leads to a new, more realistic paradigm. That's what happened with uh, Copernicus taking over from Ptolemy. But in economics, the... Failures of the paradigm are transient. So one obvious failure was not seeing the financial crisis coming. Now, I, that's one reason I stuck my neck out in 2005 to say a financial crisis is coming uh, because I knew if I didn't say it before it happened, I wouldn't be taken seriously afterwards. Mm. So I did that. I was taken seriously, not in my own home country, given the politics of the property lobby over there, but certainly the most of the rest of the world. Um, but still, what's the dominant theory of economics? It's neoclassical economics. They've continued yeah. teaching the same thing. Uh, they haven't let the fact that they couldn't see the biggest economic advance of the post-war period coming. In fact, they gave totally contrary advice about what was coming in 2008. They're advising politicians to think fabulous things were coming. Um, they're still there. Yeah, yeah. You notice the hand raising. I love that idea I because we we do have this lecturer student privilege. I'm the keener yeah. in the front row that keeps raising his hand because okay. Professor Keener, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Keen, Professor Keen. I'm the keener. So, mm -hmm. anyways, poking fun, but I think that the viewers really need to understand um, uh, how important uh, this work potentially is for the field of economics, and. And remember, with your description that economics is really just a description of what is going on and mm. does not require people to be there, what a field of study that it is because it's observational. Um, they yeah, have yeah, yeah. life as like a living experiment, basically. Yeah. Right? It doesn't have, like, doesn't, just doesn't have to be constructional. But the trouble is they uh, have a what they see as a description they also see as a set of recommendations. Capitalism will work better if you don't have trade unions, if you have very small government, if governments run surpluses, et cetera, et cetera. All this sort of stuff is put forward as being a preferred state of reality. So though you don't even need economists for economy to occur, economists dive in there and try change your economy to make it look more, look more like their model of the economy because they believe their model of the economy works very well. Now, when you look at their model, it's dysfunctional. It's all sorts of flaws in it. It doesn't describe the real world properly to begin with, and it doesn't describe itself properly. Uh, so when they try to make this stuff happen in the real world, you stuff up the real world. And you end up with their model of the economy, meaning the economy works worse than it would, would, would do if they didn't exist in the first place. Okay, so I got, I got another – I want to take this a different direction with mm. – um, 
uh, trade unions, for example. Okay, mm -hmm. and now I want you to I want you to kind of uh, imagine a conversation between you and a Marxist, and and I think mm -hmm. this is the the appropriate um, uh, you know the the appropriate um, dichotomy here. Okay, mm -hmm. in this conversation mm -hmm. socially, yeah. so. What what Steve he didn't necessarily I don't know if you asserted that that the, the trade union should be removed. Right. Because, you know, uh, but regardless, let's say that's your position. And then the 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 Marxist is going to say, no, 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 we need worker representation. Otherwise, the whole mm. world goes to hell in a handbasket kind of concept. Right. Mm. So the question in lies in a, a, the idea of a uh, an experiment of sorts. So we we say, well, we'll put a system over here on a microcosm level, as mm. instead of implementing it on a national scale, which is you know really kind of doctrinal in itself. And then we'll have another micro economy over here that, that doesn't have that, okay? And then let's agree on the metrics for measurement. Let's agree on, uh, you know, what, what should they be? Should they be, you know, worker satisfaction? Should they be, um, you know, in all sorts of types of things, right? Even if it's a subjective measure of like, do you, you know, do they enjoy, do the workers actually enjoy their position or they, do they feel fulfilled and all this kind of stuff. We don't have to define it because we're asking for their subjective opinions in a social scientific experiment. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally you're coming at this with the opposition in the key in, in two different uh, like schools of thought, so to speak. You're coming mm. at this saying, let me offer a compatible suggestion so we don't have to fight between whose ideology is right or wrong. Mm. Let's put something and then say, let's measure the results. What what do you think about that compatibility uh, strategy? Well, for a start, I'll be on the side of the Marxists because I think we do need trade unions and capitalism will function less well without them. Um, but at the same time, you simply can't do that. Uh, if, if you if very, very rarely, you simply can't say, let's have one country agree to have trade unions and another country to agree not to have trade unions. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's, that is far more fraught than vaccination, no vaccination, because there will be people in both countries who are adamant that unions should or should not exist, both extremes. So you're not going to be able to do that in the first place. And secondly, even if you did, People would say, oh, if the result didn't turn out the way that they expected it would turn out, they'd blame some idiosyncratic element of other parts of those two countries. So you simply can't do it. Uh, and, and like the one, for example, uh, in the Asian financial crisis in 1997, uh, most of the countries fell in line with the IMF and agreed to do what the IMF told them to do. And it, in particular in Indonesia, that caused an enormous collapse in the economy. In Malaysia, Mahathir, who was attacked for all sorts of other reasons uh, in, the, in that country uh, for, for taking down his, uh, one of his political rivals and uh, is, you know, all sorts of underhand politics there. Uh, but Mahathir said, no, we're not going to, uh, to do, we're not going to open up to the market. We're not going to do what the IMF says. We're going to insist anybody with uh, Malaysian ringgits has to repatriate them or they lose their money. And uh, I remember going on a TV show, a radio show in Australia, with Peter Harcher, who's the Australia, the Sydney Morning Herald's uh, foreign affairs editor, and he made a comment uh, about how Mahathir was going against the Washington consensus. And I said, "Yes, what if he succeeds? Uh, will that change the Washington consensus?" Well, guess which country came out of the Asian financial crisis best? Malaysia, by far. The others went down the tube. So Mahathir's anti-Washington consensus was correct. Did that change the Washington consensus? Not one bloody iota. Okay. Wow. So what you get as a result, even if you do manage to do the comparison you're talking about, people will ignore it if it doesn't fit their ideology. So uh, the, the, for that reason, and this is one reason why I think we're, we're facing a total social calamity because there's so many things that should have knocked neoclassical economics out of the ballpark that haven't done so, that the only thing that's going to end them is them ending us with climate change. Steve, this feels like a sucker punch to the stomach. Mm. It feels so, you know, it's it's so anti-rational, but observational in the fact that we are bound to ideological mistakes. 
Yeah. And I hope they're not fatalistic, deterministic, that we just are being pulled down a rabbit hole that we have no ability to, um, yeah, like the event horizon, right? We have just no, we just, we can just yeah. experience it and watch the, the, you know, the decline and the collapse occur in front Probably. of us. And we'll be on the wrong side of the event horizon when that happens. No. So like I've, I've had 50 years of taking on these guys yeah. and um, I've seen their persistence over half a century, which is a hell of a long time. And the capacity to continue having faith in their vision is incredible and they can't be shaken and they believe they're scientific. And with all that stuff, they're impermeable. Uh, you know, the, the financial crisis, you had literally the chief economist of the OECD coming out and saying how their forecast for the, this is in June of 2007, saying that the 2008, their forecast was strong growth and falling unemployment throughout the OECD. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to make absolutely it. wrong. I'm going to make a, a like a metaphysical proof that uh, that that Professor Keen uh, believes in a transcendental reality here, right? So, mm. insert chuckle from 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 Professor Keen. Um, <laughs> but here's the idea: is that you wouldn't be the first um, academic to leave a legacy, especially if this. Um, uh, I would say when I think there's an inevitability to this uh, mm. to this catching on, right? Either posthumously or in your lifetime. Mm. So my case for for a uh, a transcendental realization, actualization, or to use a Marxist term, reification, mm. um, uh, or reifying, is that this may happen after your death. This may happen after a considerable amount of um, uh, non-actualization in your lifetime. Right. Mm. We may go through a tremendous amount of pain past the biological existence of, of Professor Keene for it yet to be uncovered because it is in a place that we will look to, as in the Royal Society. We will look there and mm. maybe, you know, in 150 years, it gets, you know, the attention that it deserves. Right. And so would you. um would you, you know, believe in this in this type of Ionian enchantment? This the, I mean. I, it's revealing. I totally do. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've been saying for some time now that I'm writing for two generations after me. Yeah. Uh, I, because I, I look at, you know, I would like to be, to be able to advise us to get off this ship, change direction, change the captain, change the crew, et cetera, et cetera, before we smash into the iceberg. But I know that we're not going to do it until after we smash into the iceberg. And even then, we're not going to have a ship to put together. It's, you know, what can we assemble out of the life rafts is going to be the state of society. Uh, and then looking back and saying, how the hell did this happen? Then I hope to have, have one of the relic texts that explains why we got into this situation and, you know, points out the, res the, the uh, responsible guilty parties because otherwise it'll just be seen as coming down to greed of the oil and the coal people. It won't be seen anything about the ideology of capitalism that we have. Or on the other hand, you could be so extremely against capitalism that you end up in a fascist dictatorship post the crisis uh, where you're blaming, uh, the, you're blaming the, the economics rather than the economic theory. Now, I think it's feasible to have... Uh, a capitalist economy, which is strictly limited so that large parts of the planet are off limits and you make sure the energy consumption and the disruption we make to the biosphere is as mi minimized as possible and you still have the innovative drive of a capitalist economy and the best of, uh, of a um, uh, academic development of new ideas as well, uh, that combination together. Uh, it's possible to have that. Um, but we'll only have it if we realise that it was the distorted vision of capitalism beforehand that caused the crisis. Yeah. Steve, I'm going to ask you, and this will come up again and again, because I'm weaving mm -hmm. a narrative. And so consider this as like, you know, the phone ringing or mm -hmm. the alert happening and, and a writer approaches you and says, Steve, I'm writing this fictional world, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm I would like to consult with you about the uh, 
either the, well, just let's just say the economic truth of, of what I'm going to propose here. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yep. It is, mm-hmm. it's the formation of an ideology, but it's a fictional story where I'm forefront yep. with that. Right. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> the idea is that, and this is, I really like how you've just naturally brought this back into uh, a climate change uh, 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 conversation. Essentially, we really need to mm-hmm. keep coming back here. Mm-hmm. So I'm envisioning uh, a world that uh, takes on a military like response. And yeah, and, and this is hard pill for people to swallow, really, right? Mm-hmm. It really is. It's because, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're just saying, hey, you know, like, isn't that a little bit alarmist, right? So then we got to weed through all those weeds of alarmists and these types of things, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it it's kind of works against and for us. It's, it's, it's great. It may cause attention, but, you know, it's easy to compartmentalize. And we don't want compartmentalization. We want to be yeah. able to make sure that's inviting to a conversation. So I want to mm-hmm. use something flat, something uh, attention grabbing like war le- war effort, but the idea is that we're not fighting another human being. We're fighting this, you know. We're trying to change a lifestyle, and mm. and so here's in lies the, the questions economically. Okay, that uh, like what would the economic reality be to come to a homo a state of homogeneity? Okay, and this would be something like. We have universal subscription for everybody up to the age of 25. Okay. Um, after that, the the military type organization is something that is is optional, right? I guess mm-hmm. you know. I mean, we have this kind of structure, anyways, right? If you want to volunteer, you can, so on and so forth, right? Yeah. I'm talking mm-hmm. about a mass sweeping change. The other idea is to say everybody gets like a a universal payment equal to the average income of their country at that particular time. So the U.S. right now is sixty thousand dollars a year. Canada mm-hmm. is at like fifty-four. Uh, you know, Malaysia would be at something different. And so, mm-hmm. yes, there's a there's a, a a difference in scale. I would say that would economically. That's what I'm waving my flag for. Is there any reason to entertain something so ludicrous? Uh, I think it's inevitable that we're going to be forced into military arrangements to both constrain our consumption and radically change the nature of the productive system at the same time. So if you look at the Second World War, a large part of the war effort wasn't just building the tanks, it was also reducing domestic demand for cigarettes and things of that nature. Uh, So you had more and more of your industrial capacity directed at making the weapons that were necessary to defeat the Nazis and far less for consumption items. So, for example, the selling of, uh, of, uh, of war bonds, which everybody thought was raising money for the war. No, it wasn't. When you look at the accounting, the government creates the money it needs using fiat to finance the war. The sales of the war bonds actually took money out of the private sector and meant they had less to spend. And the whole idea is you wanted to reduce consumption demand during a war to focus more upon the military effort. Well, a similar thing applies here. If we realise we have to drastically reduce our load on the planet, and I'm talking by a factor of, you know, minimum two, possibly four to five times the reduction in I our pressure. It was 10, but <laughs> a magnitude. Uh, Let's just round up yeah. to the, you know, the... the, it's, the, it's, the it's, it's, it's something, something you know, to, on the way towards an order of magnitude mm-hmm. to get back to the point where we can cope with the, with the planet, can cope with the load we're putting on it. And we have to probably consider geoengineering as well in terms of getting the carbon dioxide down as fast as we can. Uh, and, dam- and limiting the damage being done by the tipping points were probably also already pushed. The, the, the Arctic, uh, the, the, the uh, ending the albedo effect of the, uh, of the Arctic by eliminating, virtually eliminating summer sea ice is probably the first major accelerant we've really hit in climate change. So we're going to be forced to go in backwards uh, in, in that sort of area. And that uh, is not something which the market economy is going to do itself. It's going to have to be by command. At the time this happens, if you just relied upon the market economy, most firms would go bankrupt for the simple reason that they couldn't meet the costs of buying their inputs and the market in which they can sell the products would no longer be profitable. So that's okay. that's the dilemma we face. All right. So I'm still going with this. I'm still pushing this idea because I, I, I think it's viable. And it, it, it yeah. you know, I mean, I'm writing it into the narrative here, so to speak. Mm. So 
it, what it means is it means political rhetoric. So imagine a politician. I'm creating the story. The politician yeah. is saying, you know, buy into party X, Y, Z. And the reason is, is you'll get a regular paycheck of this and effectively consider yourself retired. OK, mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. where did I come up with this idea of this? So I thought, well, how can we economically afford to pay everybody? Right. So you might be able to pull this to an MMT kind of concept which if we look at a total cost accounting of the environment, we now are taking into consideration sending the troops off to, or not troops, let's not use that, the workers off to the factory, so to speak, to produce, 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 you mm -hmm. know, derivative to GDP and so on and so forth, right? So I'm saying mm -hmm. it's economically more viable to say early retirement package, early retirement package, early retirement package. Mm. What does that mean for the activity and the mobility of people? It means similar to what we're doing now in terms of lockdown with COVID. Now, I'm not saying let's, you know, propagate, you know, some of the negative, um, you know, manifestations of being locked in a small space or something mm. like that. I'm saying for the most part, there is an opportunity for us to connect with family and, you know, engage in local community activities, mm. not, mm. you know, be more connected as as a as a society. Right. This is kind of the idea. This is what we advocate towards in the in the, <clears throat> you know, in the conversation. Right. Mm. The microcosm that we we advocate for. Here's the compensation. Right. And then I mm. think an entire financial sector can come to the aid of saying, look, we need to reconcile your books, so to speak, your household sort of spending mm. based off of, you know, a, an important counterpoint of, um, of of carbon neutrality. As an ideal, mm. not saying that we have to get there, but we're, you know, we're trying to do that just like a good financial planner would do. It's like mm. we're taking into consideration the carbon. OK, coming yeah. up for air. What do you think about these ideas? Well, I think, as I said, I think we have drastically overshot the point where market mechanisms alone can avoid a crisis. And if we leave it to market mechanisms alone, we'll never make a decision about reserving part of the planet for non-human life forms. So. We, I think we have, we are going to go through a huge crisis where the only way to reduce the damage we're doing to the biosphere to the stage at which the ecosystem will enable us to support our agricultural and industrial systems with a drastic reduction in the scale of those agricultural and industrial sectors. And uh, it can no longer be down to consumer taste as to what, we, what, what areas get expanded and which ones get shrunk. It's down to this, a, a ecological objective of getting to zero carbon and actually going negative carbon and then looking at the other ways in which we damage, damage the biosphere to stop those as well and go and reverse on those. So we, we go from worrying about humans to worrying about life. Yeah. And the, one, of the, one of the points of that is human life ranks a lot lower uh, than we used to rank it compared to the rest of life on the planet because uh, we are a predator that, that has overstepped the capacity of the prey to support us and so much so that we could destroy the whole fabric of life on this planet or certainly seriously damage it. Uh, and what we really, we're doing that, we have to have compulsion. We can't let people do just what they want to do. It's like letting a lion decide it's going to kill off the last, uh, the last wildebeest.